Hello, Blenders. Hello, listeners and viewers of Freelance Blend. This is Marv De Leon. And today, I'm very excited to have with us a very special guest with us. Um, yeah, he, I've met him online um, a few times. Uh, and I've been on his show and I'm, I'm very honored to be invited to his uh, very popular podcast, so it's uh, it's my turn now to to have him on the show, so that my followers, you, the listeners and viewers of Freelance Blend, will get to know this amazing guy. Uh, we have we haven't met in person, but I, I'm sure very soon we will because we'll talk about that uh, a special uh, something we're cooking up something in, in the coming uh, weeks. So without further ado, we have with us the um, owner and operator of rickyshetty.com. Daddyblogger.com. He's also a podcaster like me at Digital Nomad Mastery. And he's also um, one of the founders of uh, Freedom Summit Global at freedomsummitglobal.com. So without further ado, Mr. Ricky Shetty. Hi, Ricky. So, hello. Uh, salamat. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marvin. It's an uh, honor and a joy to be on your podcast. Uh, I found out about you uh, Quite a while ago, uh, back in uh, March of 2018, uh, when I spoke at an event uh, where I saw your book called Cyberpreneur. You were one of the featured authors yes. in it. So I had a chance to get to know about you and then, uh, you know, obviously uh, get to know you through the podcast I did with you. And then now you'll be also speaking at my upcoming Freedom Summit Global. So always a joy and a pleasure to connect with you. And thanks for having me on the Freelance Blend. Yes, it's it's an honor, as I said. And uh, yeah, I... Unfortunately, unfortunately, you haven't met in person, but I think I, I, um, I know you very well. I, I, we see each other virtually every day uh, because of what we're coming up uh, in the next few weeks. But before we talk about that, um, we'd like to get to know more about the Daddy Blogger. So uh, can you tell us, I, I assume you, you started blogging uh, ahead of me. So, and uh, you, ha you really have a, a great, dot com daddy blogger very straightforward and uh, I, i'm interest, interested how you were able to get that uh, daddy blogger domain uh, so can you tell us how you started in the online world yeah sounds good uh, so i've been the internet marketer for the last seven years um you know i've started like everyone else so we work in corporate canada corporate philippines corporate america right no matter where in the world you're watching or listening to this from, you usually start working in a corporation or a company or a business, right? Uh, yeah. And then uh, you start, you know, some people, some people get fed up of it. They're like, ah, I don't like uh, going to rush hour traffic. I don't like my boss. I want to have the freedom, freedom of money and time and location and uh, flexibility of schedule, right? So I was that person. Uh, I worked in um, corporate Canada where I'm from. I'm from Vancouver, BC, Canada. I was working in a bank, uh, Scotia Bank, which is the top five banks in Canada. I left that and I started doing uh, ESL teaching in Japan and then I did ESL teaching in Australia and ESL teaching back in Canada. And then um, I, I started uh, going into entrepreneurship and business uh, around the seven years ago, Mark. Um, I started with uh, easy point of entry, which is blogging. I was like, hey, I don't have much money. Not sure what I want to do. Uh, let me just start a blog and see what happens. So easy entry point, started a blog and uh, it was just a locally based blog in Vancouver. It started taking off in terms of the traffic and in terms of the visibility, credibility, and it became national, then it became international, but now it's a global brand, daddyblogger.com. I started getting featured in different media, um, international media, like the Huff, Huffington Post, Huff Post, the Arrington Huffington, uh, got featured on John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneur on Fire podcast, one of the top podcasts in the world, uh, got featured across Canada in CTV, Global, uh, TV, Print, Radio. Um, so I became a global brand quite quickly with that blog. Uh, so now it's one of the top resources for others in the world. Uh, but the problem was that I'll just be frank, direct, and honest here. I wasn't making money. <laughs> I was uh, getting free stuff, which a lot of bloggers do. You know, who loves free stuff? I was getting <laughs> stuff sent to me like um, gadgets and tech and uh, uh, products for kids and products for families. I was doing reviews of different hotels. And it was great living really nicely in terms of getting free stuff. But it wasn't paying the bills. So... Uh, I was getting paid sponsors too, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't sustainable. So I started branching into different areas in internet marketing. I built up a successful blog. So I started coaching people on how they can start to get it started as a blogger. Uh, then I, start, I launched my podcast as well. I launched my YouTube channel and I started expanding from just a blogger to more of a um, social media influencer, if you want to call it that. 
so building up a successful blog, successful social media following, successful um, podcast, and a successful YouTube channel, right? And then I started launching to different products online, so actual paid products. I got started with uh, book publishing on Kindle and Amazon. Uh, so now I have five Amazon best-selling books. Uh, you can go look them up under my name on Amazon Kindle. Uh, then I got started on Udemy. Uh, so now I have 15 different courses on Udemy. Um, uh, and then I started expanding into different areas. So basically uh, doing affiliate marketing. I, I do coaching as well. So I have a model that's a multiple streams of income model where it's not just one dominant income stream, which is coaching if you want to look at it in terms of the highest paying one. But I, I have income coming in from my blog sponsors, income coming in from my Udemy sales, income coming in from my YouTube channel through ad revenue, um, and an income coming in through, uh, you know, um, events I'm running as well. Uh, so it, it's very much a multiple streams of income model, but it all started with my blog. And that's the brand I'm most known for because it's the longest running. And honestly, at the end of the day, Marv, uh, that's my biggest passion, fatherhood, marriage, and family. And I'm going to stay a dad to the day I die, right? So I'll always yeah. be known by that brand. Other businesses might come and go, but I'll always be as a husband, you know, my ring on my finger and um, <laughs> the, the hug for my kids till the day I die. So that's why I'm known as the daddy blogger, first and foremost. Yeah. And I think that's why I, I, I really resonate with what you're doing because I'm also a dad. I'm a hands-on dad. I work from home. I have two kids. Uh, but yeah, um, can you... Can you I think um, if you can mention that, I think, uh, can you tell us um, how many kids you have? And I believe you're married to a Filipina, right? That's why you're here in our beloved country. Yeah, I didn't share that story. So um, what happened is uh, I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and uh, my wife's actually from the Philippines. Yes, represent Philippines. Yes. She is from uh, La Union, LU, uh, which is a province about six, six, seven hours, depending on traffic, uh, by bus north of Manila, six <laughs> to seven hours, right? So La Union. So she's Ilocano, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the people from the area, Ilocano. So um, she actually uh, was working for Accenture Philippines. Um, Accenture is a big IT company. And uh, Accenture Philippines sent her to Canada to, uh, on a work contract. She stayed for one year, two year, three year, get, kept getting extended. And then by the third year in Canada, we met at a local church. So we are both Christians. I'm actually a Dean pastor as well. We didn't forget to, me- we forgot to mention that. But uh, um, so at our local church, we won the greeting team together. I was greeting people as they entered the church. She was assigned to greet with me. And then, uh, you know, we started dating, got engaged, uh, uh, you know, got married. And after we got married, we started having the kids, right? The first kid, second kid, third kid. We have three kids now. Um, Rianne, who's six. Ryan, who's five. And Renzo, who's, who's two, six, five, and two-year-old. And they're half East, half Filipinas, and half Indian Canadians because my ethnic background is Indian. So Indian Canadian uh-huh. Filipinas. And now, now uh, we, we uh, relocated the Philippines. I'll tell you that story quickly. Uh, we were in Canada. We were living the typical traditional suburban life that most parents live around the world. We, uh, you know, we uh, started dating, got engaged, got married, um, bought a house, bought a car, uh, put our kids in school, and we're living the suburban dream, right? The America dream, they call it. Like the white picket fence, you know, the, the, the tiny dog. I didn't have a dog, but, you know, two and a half kids, they say. Uh, I don't have two and a half. I just have three. But, you know, that's like <laughs> the, the, the statistic, right? Like the American dream statistic. Right, for us, it's a Canadian dream or the Filipino dream. Like most Filipinos want that, right? House, kids, um, um, you know, enough money to stay in their education for the kids. They'll be happy. For us, we have that. But we weren't happy. The missing part was happiness. Because I was like, okay, is this all we want to have in life? Living the suburb for the rest of our life when there's this whole world of opportunity and adventure waiting for us to explore it. So we made a radical decision to sell everything and travel the world. And that's exactly what we did. We, uh, we left Vancouver on December 6, 2016. And we've been nomadic for over two years now. Uh, we traveled to, I've been to 81 countries now, six continents. Uh, my kids at the age of five, and you know, six, they've been already 20 countries on four continents at that younger age. And our goal is to be the first family in human history to visit every single country in the world. And we had to make sacrifices. We had to sell our stuff. We had to change our priorities. We had to, um, we had to go against the grain of society norm, the societal normal, but norm by becoming a digital nomad family. We had to struggle financially. Again, I'll just be blunt here. I'm very honest and vulnerable. We struggled financially when we were traveling. We're like, I don't know if we can sustain this, right? So uh, by the end of the one year of traveling, we were running out of money. So we're like, what should we do? Should we go back to Canada? Should we go settle somewhere? And we decided to come to the Philippines because it's cheap <laughs> compared to Canada. <laughs> we're like, 
we wanted to live somewhere else. We wanted to show our kids about their Filipino ethnic heritage. And then my wife's mom got sick as well. So it's like the perfect scenario to come here because my wife wanted to take care of her mom. Uh, we wanted to live in a country that's tropical, hot, uh, not the cold Vancouver that's happening right now, <laughs> yeah. cold Canadian winter. So the, the scenario worked out really well for us to come here because of my wife's mom being sick. Um, uh, the low cost of living here in the Philippines, the warm climate that we, we wanted, the warm climate, and the opportunity for our kids to learn about their ethnic identity. So the pieces of the puzzle came together that we relocated here to the Philippines, and we love it. There's obviously going to be good and bad. Uh, don't mention Manila traffic to anyone, right? Because uh, <laughs> no one likes Manila traffic, right? So there's yeah. going to be good and bad no matter where. We, we have a house in La Union. Uh, we commute, I commute back and forth more to Manila because I do business here. Um, but we're based in La Union and uh, we like it because there's no traffic and uh, we have the tro- you know, the nice uh, ocean breeze or uh, so, but we have the opportunity to come to Manila when we need to do business and commerce and, you know, build, build what I'm doing locally. So that mm-hmm. in a nutshell is my story of coming to the Philippines. I know it's a long mm-hmm. one, but hopefully it helped uh, put the picture together. Yeah. Well, you're, you're able to answer most of the questions I was supposed to ask while you were uh, telling your story, but I think uh, <laughs> what I want to no, I um, rewind a bit. Is um, so you were um, working for a bank like myself. I was also working for a for an international bank, um, and um, my office mates don't really understand what's the online world, what freelancing is, what blogging is. So I would like to understand how you how how you were able to discover blogging and. Um, well, you say you said that um, you were earning well and you were living the American or Canadian dream, but you said that you weren't happy. Uh, I assume you're you're, you're getting uh, paid well, but um, yeah. what what really uh, what really pushed you? Uh, and what did you see in in blogging and online marketing and online world that made you just you know take that leap from the corporate? Honestly, world? yeah. Yeah, honestly, money isn't the path to happiness. You know, a lot of people say, when I have enough money, I'll be happy. That's false. You could have all the money in the world, but be the unhappiest person in the world, okay? Uh, so, but I'm not saying money is bad or good. I'm just saying it isn't the true path to like the, the it's not the golden ticket, right? Like happiness means different things to different people. Um, so we were making like, uh, you know, 100,000 uh, plus a year combined, me and my wife, right? She had a stable job with Accenture Canada. I, I had my internet marketing business. So we were making... Uh, um, a salary that is comfortable. We were comfortable, uh, but we weren't happy. Like it wasn't like we were both working like crazy. My wife was working crazy hours, like, you know, nine to five. I was working evenings doing my events. And um, we were like, uh, not, we weren't at the place where we had what we wanted for. We had money, we had the house, we had the car, uh, we had the kids, but we didn't have that missing the, the, the happiness. And for everyone, you got to answer that question for yourself. Um, some people, that is definition of happiness. They have money, they have a house, they have a car, and they have kids. Boom, they're happy. Case closed. For us, we were missing a value system, right? What's Sorry, uh, what's the value system? Uh, this is for you, your listeners, right? What's your value system, right? Is it house, car, family equals happiness? Or for us, it's like adventure, uh, you know, global change, etc. So we were mm, locally okay you know like we were okay in terms of like everything which on the surface looks okay but i i personally wasn't internally uh, satisfied i was going through depression i was confused i was like is this really all there is to life like we have money we have a car we have a house and i was like um i i i i'm a big adventurer and a traveler and i love that part of life and i wasn't doing that so i was feeling incomplete i was like okay we've achieved this pinnacle of success quote unquote but there's a missing travel ingredient and some people travels are important they're like okay we got the house, the car, and the, the everything else, but we don't need the travel part. For me, I was like, we have that, but we don't have the travel part, right? So the travel was actually a higher value to me than the house, the car, and the stability, right? So you, I can't say that for you who are listening here today, but for me, when we started traveling, boom, my mental health, depression, anxiety, whatever I was facing in Vancouver, uh, not, I didn't like the Vancouver winters, right? I was struggling internally. Um, that started lifting, and traveling has really helped me to uh, achieve the sense of inner happiness. And I consider now that I'm in the Philippines, I'm still traveling. I'm still 
it's not the same type of global travel for me. Obviously, if you're a local Filipino, it's not the same. But for me, as a foreigner here, it's like new and exciting. I'm riding jeepneys and pedicabs and tricycles and tuk-tuks. And uh, I'm learning about bargaining and bartering. And I'm learning about um, the different foods and so culture. So it's like a travel experience for me. So I'm on the, the travel high by be, basing myself here. And my wife at the end of the day, like you have to, this is like a solution for happiness, not just individually, but in a family. What is your wife or your partner uh, need, right? So my wife likes stability and security. So now we have that here and she wanted to be with her mom. We have that here. She wanted to teach our kids about the language that they weren't gonna learn in, in Vancouver, right? They were, they were learning English and French. They weren't gonna learn to, all, uh, to the degree they're learning here. So again, it was the value of my, me and the value of my wife wanting her Filipino roots, the language, the family connection. So it, it makes sense for us what we're doing. You as listeners who are listening and watching to this podcast, figure out your purpose, your vision, your values, and then figure out if your life is fitting that. If it's not, time for change. We made this radical change, shift our life to fit our values. So I can't answer the question of whether it's right for you, but I can ask you to answer the question for yourself. What's your why? What's your purpose? What are your values? And what are you doing to live that fully? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very powerful. You're, you're talking, when you're talking about your value system, your, your value that number one is travel. So somehow I, again, resonated with that. I, my, I, I can feel my uh, hair here <laughs> stand up. And, <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, although I haven't done that for, for myself and my, for my family, uh, we've been traveling, but not as, not a hundred countries like you, but um, for somebody who is who is still stuck like in the corporate world, and um, uh, you said to for them to figure out their why, and, and they have and if they have a family like a spouse who is still has um, second thoughts about um, like leaving everything and, and just um, following their why or um, doing what you did. So how, how do you, what, what do you say to, to like a, a, a husband or a wife yeah. who wants to somehow convince his family that uh, this is something that we should explore? Yeah, I, I, I always, if you're talking to as a family, there's a family vision. It's not the Ricky vision, it's not the Mar vision, it's not the our wife's vision, right? It's a family vision. What's best for the family unit? For husband, wife, and kids, right? You got to look at all the variables. I can't do what's best for me if my wife suffers and kids suffer. We can't do, do what's best for my wife if I suffer and my kids suffer. We can't do what's best for, for our kids if we aren't happy as a marital, you know, husband and wife couple, right? So it's very much about the family vision. I've actually gone through like coaching um, and we've come up with actually a vision for a family in terms of what is our values, what's important to us, right? So, and it's never going to be perfect. Because at the end of the day, we're all individuals. Like I want something different than my wife. My kids want something different. Obviously, we are the decision makers because their kids are young. But when they become teenagers, adults, what's best for them when they have an ability to uh, vocalize their, their core belief system, right? So we have to do it from a top down, if you want to look at that, from a um, mother, father, husband, wife. And we make the decisions, what we feel is best for our kids, which we feel travel is the best education in the world, hands down, right? I again, we'll talk about education, but it's like, we've tried traditional schooling, private, public. We've tried world schooling, traveling around. Uh, now we've put them in a local school here in La Union. Honestly, the travel, when they travel to 20 countries, beats La Union, no offense to La Union teachers, sorry guys. And no offense, <laughs> to, the, no offense to the teachers back in Vancouver. Uh, sorry, I'm just saying blunt. Travel was the best education for our kids, hands down. They're learning good stuff in schools. I'm not an anti-school by any means. I'm just saying supplement traditional schooling with travel schooling, right? Um, you know, so th that's why we put them back in schooling because there's benefits to schooling, like socialization, um, you know, the, the structure that you might not have at the whole, as a homeschooler, world schooler, or unschooler, or life schooler, right? So there's, uh, I mean, it's a whole different ballgame uh, in terms of educational the rabbit hole. <laughs> but answering your question, Marvin, you don't convince. You don't convince your spouse because if you convince, then the spouse won't be happy. What, what, what we did is we just had 
at the end of the day, communication, right? We talked a lot. We sat down. We got some insights from our uh, mentors and coaches and friends uh, on our decision. Uh, we talked to other families who had made this decision, right? So, like, it, that's probably the most wisest thing we did. We talked to other families who are already living the life we're considering doing, right? So, and now I'm paying it forward because now we're living this life and now I'm paying it forward to other families, right? But we asked other families, well, like, okay, how do you deal with the schooling? How do you deal with the money? How do you deal with the vaccinations, the health? How do you deal with um, socialization and friendships? How do you deal with everything that this lifestyle entails, right? And no lifestyle is a perfect lifestyle. I'm not advocating this lifestyle is better than any other lifestyle. There's advantages of the suburban lifestyle, which we don't have right now, which is the stability, the security, a comfortable pillow, a car to drive. Like we, like we didn't have the car to drive when we were traveling around the world, right? Uh, we didn't have the same pillow. We were staying in hostels and hotels and Airbnbs, and we were constantly moving. And there's a disadvantage to that in terms of energy and fatigue and tiredness, right? So it's not really about convincing your spouse or your husband or your wife. It's about um, seeing if this is a good fit for the family unit and uh, trialing it. That's my other piece of advice. Trial it. See if it works for six, three months, six months, a year. Do it for a month even. Uh, maybe from like the, the summer months or the Christmas holidays. Do it for like two weeks or a month, right? Everyone's done a two-week vacation. So I think that's not really a trial because we all do like, you know, like holidays yeah. and whatever, wherever you do, right? Um, so maybe like trial it for a little bit longer than the typical vacation. Do it for a month if you feel comfortable doing it for a month. Take time off work if you need to and just take a leave of absence. Do it for a month and see how it affects each family member and the family unit as a whole. How does it affect the husband? How does it affect the wife? How does it affect each individual kid? And then how does it affect the family as a whole? If one of those pieces are missing, then don't continue. Don't continue the travel long term. If you feel it's working to the degree that you make a decision as a family, it's working, continue. And at times, like we did, we had to stop the travel, relocate the Philippines. And there'll be a time in the Philippines where we'll make a decision whether is this the best long-term strategy for our kids in terms of their future, their education, their opportunities, or do we need to relocate or travel again, right? So it's constantly having like the general vision, uh, but also, also adapting it and molding it as time goes. So hopefully that answers the question, Mark. Yeah, definitely. Um, so now the Philippines is your base. You said you're located here, but you still... Uh, travel and then come back to the Philippines uh, again as your as, as your base is that uh, is yeah. that correct? This uh, so we're recording this interview in February. In March, April, I'll be yeah. In March, April this year, I'll be heading to um, um, Kuala Lumpur, then Singapore, then Bali, then Chiang Mai to produce my five city conference series. Planning um, Hong Kong and India at the end of the year, and I I, I, I look at it like I never like to do just a vacation. Um, I do actually, sorry, I want to correct that. I don't <laughs> mind doing, I, I, I don't mind just doing the vacations, but I look at opportunities to make money while I'm traveling too, right? Because the model of digital nomadism is like, you make money while traveling. It's not the vacation model, okay? What I'm trying to do here is correct the maybe misconceptions people have. A holiday is you take a break from work. You go to a book a hotel, you enjoy the swimming pool, you don't think about work. That's called a vacation, a holiday, <laughs> a getaway. That's a traditional travel model. What we're talking about is you're working while traveling. So it's not just like you're hanging out and traveling in the most beautiful beaches in the world. You're working. Um, you know, like uh, I'm working typically like maybe 30, 40, maybe even more hours. Uh, sometimes it's like 50 hours, honestly, or more a week. So I, I'm working as well while I'm traveling. I just happen to be working from my laptop. So I have this location independence. My office is my laptop. But if I'm not at my office, I'm going to go broke. I'm going to run out of money. And I'm going to end up homeless, eating food from the garbage <laughs> right <laughs> so I, I need i need my office which is my laptop everywhere otherwise my business won't function right so um i just wanted to correct that maybe misconception that it's uh, a vacation it is not a it's not a constant vacation it's hard yeah. it's difficult you're working with different time zones you're working with different internet connection variability um so you're working with different desks right you're moving literally you're moving your laptop and going to a different desk and then going to a different uh, bed and then going yeah. to a different coffee uh, coffee shop Go in a restaurant, working, working wherever you can, right? So, uh, and in terms of the base, yeah, we are going to base ourselves here this year. And we're, we're I'm, all, um, I'm all, always talking to my wife about, is this the best for our kids? This is the best for our kids, right? Because at the end of the day, we're thinking about legacy and uh, them because we're going to die in the next 
40 years or so, 50 years, mm-hmm. maybe 50, 60 years if we're lucky, right? Depends how old we are. I'm 40, 43 now. So, you know, if I live 100 plus, I'm, I'm We're happy almost guy, the same but, age. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, we are going to die. It's just fact, right? There's no avoiding death. So we have to leave this world a better place for our kids. We have to uh, put our kids in the best possible position to succeed, which is, again, happiness first. Happiness and health, right? We all know that as dads and moms. We want happiness and health for our kids. Uh, so yeah. if we're not happy as moms and dads, how can we instill the same values to our kids, happiness and health, happiness and health, right? So, yeah, at the end of the day, are we creating a future for our kids which will lead to happiness and health? And if we are, job done, you know, parenting, parenting goals accomplished. Mm-hmm. Well, um, yeah, definitely. I, I think um, that concept of being a, a family traveling, uh, and as you say, not just traveling uh, to as a vacation, but also to work is, is still a very, very new concept here in the Philippines. I, I think you're the only family I know here in the Philippines doing that. So um, maybe the listeners are still wondering how, let's say you, you talked about um, talking about uh, uh, understanding your why and then having that conversation. And let's say uh, the family... Uh, agreed that let's let's do this. So um, and, and you said that maybe first do a trial for a month. So yeah, what's the what are the steps like? Um, which what are the best countries to visit? What's a family? What's a family friendly country that can maybe um, that can give them the the confidence that they can do this. Uh, again, another trial. So what would you suggest would be the first few steps? Because again, this is a very, very new concept here. Not, I'm sure you've, uh, you've talked to a lot of Filipino families and they're amazed when you talk about your stories. Mm-hmm. So yeah. what do you say to those families who would like to do what you're doing right now? Yeah, firstly, what we're doing is unconventional globally. It's not the model that families uh, do anywhere, <laughs> whether it's Canadian, American, European, Australian, New Zealand, first world, second world, third world, African, South American, Latino, Filipino, Chinese, right? Most, mo- this, most families follow the typical model that society is dictated, which, I, which we elaborated in the first part of the interview, right? You know, we know this. We know this model. Uh, go to school, get a, uh, you know, get a job, uh, make enough money to b- get married, buy the, pro- buy the engagement ring, right? Propose. She says yes, hopefully. Cross your fingers, right? Then uh, get, get married, spend a lot of money in your wedding, right? And then you have hardly enough money for the actual marriage. <laughs> Everyone does this, you know? And then uh, uh, once you get married, you buy your house, buy your car, and then have kids. And then you follow that pattern, right? It's a pattern. So break the pattern. This is how you do it, Okay real hard facts. This is how you break the pattern. Three steps to be a digital nomad. This is, I've actually done a TEDx talk on this last year in Tacloban, Leyte, in uh, the Eastern Visayas. Three steps to be a digital nomad. This applies to families, singles, couples, um, gay, straight, <laughs> uh, any, anyone, right? So three steps to be a digital nomad. First, you got to save. Secondly, you got to sell. Thirdly, you got to serve. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outline those and then I'll answer your question about which countries that you can visit in the world. So save. We, we all know travel costs money for the flight, for the hotels. There's four costs you're going to encounter when it comes to travel. Flights, accommodation, food, sightseeing, okay? I'll repeat it. Flights, yeah. accommodation, food, and sightseeing. Those aren't variable costs. You, you got you to gotta fly unless you're um, doing domestic travel, right? Or unless you're taking a boat to Taiwan or to, uh, to uh, one of the other islands. Uh, you can take a boat, by the way, to Borneo in Malaysia, and then you can actually go by boat. But you know what I'm saying? Mostly, yeah. mo- especially in the Philippines, because it's an isolated island <laughs> chain, right? So you need to fly unless you're going to Borneo or Taiwan or one of the other surrounding islands, island countries. Um, so flight, non-negotiable, right? It's like a, an, you, it's a fixed cost. Um, you can get cheap flights by booking early, etc. You can do travel hacking. Uh, that's basically leveraging credit card points and miles to get discount of flights. If you're a credit uh, travel hacker, you can Google travel hacking. Um, but the, the flights are very um, hard to change. And then the accommodation. So there's some ways to save money on accommodation, okay? I'm talking about saving. Um, save on accommodation many ways. Firstly is by staying in a cheaper place, right? Like uh, maybe staying in a, the hostels are actually very family friendly nowadays. Uh, they'll have private rooms uh, where you'll have uh, maybe two double beds in a private room and a hostel will be cheaper than a hotel or resort. 
Um, so that's the option. There's also the Airbnb model where you actually stay in a local person's home, uh, which you have all the facilities you need, like cooking, uh, refrigerator, um, where then you don't have to eat out all the time, right? So saving money, well, cook at the Airbnb, right? Um, um, that's one model. Also getting a, starting a travel blog because as a travel blogger, we can get free hotels, free resort stays, uh, free sightseeing, uh, free food at restaurants, and potentially flights to and from the destination. So I, I teach travel blogging as well. We have to do a whole separate podcast on that. Basically, yeah. the quick model of travel blogging, you make a blog, market a blog, monetize a blog. Making a blog is build a brand first, marketing a blog through email marketing, social media marketing, um, you know, uh, video marketing, et cetera, and then monetizing a blog through creating your own products and services, affiliate marketing, and sponsors, okay? That's the blogging model, whole different podcast. Saving yeah. money is key, right? So saving money while... Before you travel, while you travel as well. So saving money, allocating a certain amount towards your travel budget, cutting back on those things like Ubers or Grabs, right? Every time you take an Uber or Grab, I'm just going to say the example of Grab because, you know, most of the Philippine audience here. Typical Grab ride is 250 pesos, uh, five US dollars for one way, okay? Depends yeah. where you're traveling to. I'm just using estimates. One way, 250 pesos, five US dollars. Second way, back, another 250 pesos, five US dollars. That's 10 US dollars per day times 30 days if you do it daily is uh, 300 US dollars per month just on transport alone for Grab. Times that by 12, right? 12 months times 300. That's $3,600 US just on Grab rides alone. That can buy you a ticket anywhere in the world. Maybe in business class. <laughs> it wow, cannot, yeah. Just on Grab alone. I'm gonna, I, 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 I take jeepneys and buses every now and then I'll take a Grab as well. So prioritize travel and stop taking those expensive grab rides, right? That's uh, tip number one. Restaurant meals, right? If you want to eat out all the time, you're not going to have enough money left over for travel, especially if you're in a budget, right? So cutting back on those transport costs, those food costs, those maybe sightseeing, uh, those um, um, you know, movies out or whatever you're doing locally, uh, cut back on those and then allocate that towards travel budget. Allocate that towards travel budget. When you're traveling, uh, travel like a local. Take public transport while you're traveling. Uh, take uh, stay in local people's homes doing homestays or Airbnbs, what I mentioned, right? And then um, maybe you're cooking instead of eating out all the time or eating street food, uh, right? If you eat in a restaurant here in Manila, where I'm currently when I'm doing this call, um, you know, it might cost me five to 10 US dollars for a nice restaurant meal. Just, you know, the yeah. facts of the, what type of restaurant. Eating on the street, uh, you know, in the, some of those mom and pop shops, that'll cost me like $2, like 50 to 100 pesos, like, you know, a couple bucks for a meal. So, by eating a couple of dollar meal, uh, at, you know, like a local place, you'll save money. Again, it's all about how do you save. That's step number one. Save, 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 save. Okay. Um, now when it comes to um, uh, selling, okay. So I, I look at selling two ways. Firstly, you can do something radical like we did. Become a nomadic family, selling everything and traveling. Uh, my mom and dad are still in Vancouver, so I've put the essentials in like the wedding album. I'm not going to sell my wedding album or <laughs> kids' memories and all that. That's all with my parents, right? So if, if and when we do go back in terms of either relocating back or, or back, you know, repatriating, if you want to call that, back to Canada, or whether we just go on vacations every summer when the weather's good, we have our stuff that's important. The stuff's not really important because what's really important at the end of the day is our family and we can buy clothes on the road, <laughs> which we do, right? We, 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 honestly, you need a passport and the rest is details. Mm -hmm. We travel carry-on only. Uh, we've been traveling around the world with carry-on only. Um, we have three kids, carry-on only. I see Filipino families, they have all these suitcases and bags. I'm just like smiling with them. I'm like, ah, we have three kids, carry-on only. And you guys have these <laughs> huge suitcases full of stuff. I'm just like. I, I hope you, I, you don't, I, I don't see you in the airport. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. I see so many people in the airport. I just kind of chuckled to my wife. I'm like, aren't you glad we decided to do carry-on only? I'll explain how we do that. I know I'm getting on a tangent, but basically carry-on only, the way we do that is um, I have a backpack that can fit the clothes for myself. It's usually one week of clothes, t-shirt, pants, shorts, you know, one week of clothes uh, for myself and my two older kids. My wife has a little rolly bag, which is good for her stuff and for the little son's uh, clothes, right? So that's all we need, really. Uh, everything else we can buy on the road. We have some medicine and like essential stuff. I carry my laptop and uh, phone, right? Um, I don't even have a DSLR. I, I don't want to travel with one. So that's how we do the, uh, the actual uh, Karen only because I know people might ask that. So I'll go back <laughs> to my selling, okay? So selling. going back to my saving, selling, serving. 
So say, I mean, we've already talked about that. Selling basically is you either sell everything, go, go crazy and travel the world, or you sell what you don't need, right? We all have stuff we don't need. Uh, you probably have stuff in your house. Everyone who's watching right now, listening right now, you have stuff you don't need. Dematerialize, right? Uh, do the condo, right? Uh, uh, spark joy. Get rid of the stuff. Be minimalist, right? There's a certain philosophy of the digital nomad lifestyle, which is minimalism, laptop lifestyle, you know, uh, freedom to wear what you want. There's a certain ideology, uh, and it includes the minimalism ide ideology, right? So uh, I am here to convince you to be a minimalist, okay? I'm not here to convince <laughs> you to sell everything, but be minimalist. You don't need that much stuff, okay? Yeah, whoever, whoever is listening and watching. So yeah. selling. That's selling your physical stuff, okay? Uh, yeah. You could sell your, your house, your car. And again, that's money towards the travel budget. You can buy another car in the future. Come back, you know, uh, get a car if you need one in the future. Uh, selling online, okay, this is a big question. You know, we could talk hours on this subject, right? We have a whole summit dedicated to making money online. <laughs> there yeah. are so many ways to make money online. Google it. If you Google it, you're going to get millions and millions and millions, you know, uh, of different websites related to making money online. There's like categories, okay? There's like um, marketing, you can make money online doing things mar like social media marketing. Uh, you can do... Um, you can do like uh, teaching. There's, so this, I'll, I'll kind of go through some of the categories. So there's like the teaching category, which is things like coaching, consulting, uh, teaching online ESL, course. teaching languages, uh, teaching anything online, right? Basically, yeah, online course to Udemy. There's the e-commerce category, basically selling something either digitally or physically. E-commerce um, through uh, Amazon, Kindle, Alibaba, Shopify, you know, any of those different uh, online marketing, uh, basically Amazon's the big one, Alibaba second, eBay's third, right? Shopify is like self-hosted e-commerce. Um, so you can do e-commerce as one model. Um, social media marketing is another model. Coaching consulting is another model. Um, this, uh, you can do website. Yeah, see, see like, I mean, the, uh, this is why there's millions of sites because I can't even think of them <laughs> right now, right? So you can do like, yeah, freelancing. Um, you can do virtual assistance. You can do accounting. You can do uh, remote work. Remote work basically means you're working for a company remotely. Uh, so the company's paying you, but you have the opportunity to work for the company and have a stable, secure salary. Freelancing, you might be up and down, right? Uh, especially if you're just starting out. My advice always is this. Don't just quit your job and go crazy if you don't have a, a nest egg to, to, to uh, support yourself. Otherwise, you're going to be struggling and borrowing money and putting on credit cards and going to debt, right? So my, my advice is this, start a side hustle, right? If you're working in a corporate job, start a side hustle. Side hustle basically means you're working um, in your job. You're working in your nine to five or a nine to six job, eight to six, whatever you are working. Plus you have your evening hours where you can do your side hustle project, which might be e-commerce. It might be uh, starting a blog, starting a podcast, starting a YouTube channel, getting YouTube ad revenue, getting blog and podcast sponsors, uh, doing affiliate marketing. Uh, maybe you start a VA company, right? Doing virtual assistance, uh, website design, graphic design, social media marketing, SEO work, et cetera, right? So, and, uh, you know, Marv is the guru at this, the freelance blend. Make sure you listen to all his podcasts for all the different uh, experts. He interviews about all the different ways that freelancers, entrepreneurs, business owners can make money. Read the book, uh, read some books, right? Like uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Start With Why, Simon Sinek, uh, you know, Think You Grow Rich. Um, you know, Napoleon Hill, like all these different uh, seven habits of effective people, Dave Carney. These are kind of like the Bibles, if you want to call it that, of the business entrepreneurship world. And start making money online. That's my bottom line. Regardless of what you do, the future or the current reality is already the internet in terms of income. Because that is ultimate freedom. If you're making money online, go do what you would need to do. Stay in Manila if you're here, stay in Canada if you're there. Travel if you want to, relocate if you want to. If your family gets sick like we did, come to the Philippines, take care of your mom, right? That's ultimate freedom to go where you want, when you want, with who you want, and not answerable to anyone. You're not answerable to a boss. You're not answerable mm -hmm. to a company. You have the choice because of the freedom that the laptop lifestyle provides, okay? Lastly, I know I've answered this question in longer than I expected to. <laughs> Lastly. You could travel the world, you could make all the money in the world, but if you don't help others, it's all for nothing. That's why I promote volunteerism and serving and impacting and giving back. So travel for the sake of taking the selfies, you know, with the Eiffel Tower, the selfies of Machu Picchu, the Taj Mahal, the pyramids, the Great Wall of China, uh, you know, like those things are great. But if you're just doing that, having a whole bunch of selfies, it's all vanity, it's all narcissism. 
what does that really mean in terms of the impact we want to make on a global level, right? So I advocate volunteerism strongly. I'm a strong proponent of volunteering while you're traveling. That's what exactly what we do. We uh, stay in orphanages. Uh, we've stayed in orphanages now in four continents, Asia, Africa, South America, North America. We work with a company called, um, a nonprofit called uh, Save, um, SOS Children's Village. So, uh, Save SOS Children's Village, they, are, they have orphanages globally, including here in the Philippines. They have them across the Philippines too. Uh, we uh, teach English in the orphanages. We uh, do arts and crafts with the orphans. We teach our kids how lucky, privileged they are not to be orphans, right? I mean, no offense to orphans, but I'm just saying, like, compared to an orphan, their, their life is good. They have a mom. They have a dad. They have a house, a car, you know, like, they have toys. They have clothes. So the shift that happened to our families when we stayed in an orphanage uh, in uh, Medellin, Colombia, and uh, my kids, they were so used to asking for stuff all the time. They see a commercial. I want that, Eddie. I, the, the Christmas, I want that, Daddy. It's like materialism. We're, again, we're teaching our kids to be minimalist. So we went to orphanage. We were like, hey, kids, check out how many toys these orphans have. And they have hardly anything, right? And the, the kids, they started, like, they reprogramming their mind. Like, what is, what is this place? The kids are like, like, they don't get it fully what's an orphan. They don't get the philosophy of orphanages until they see it, right? I can explain that to them, like, until the cows come home. When they saw it, they're like, where's the mommy and daddy? Oh, they starting to get it. They don't have a mom and dad. They don't have lots of toys. They starting to get it. And then this is the most powerful moment for me is that at the end of our stay at the orphanage, my, uh, I said to my kids, I said, guys, say bye to the, the kids you met. Maybe we'll see them again. And uh, I get choked up even now. My kids said, can we give our toys away to orphans? I was like, what? And they literally gave away the toys that they've been traveling with to the orphans one by one. And to me, that's the definition of travel success. Not the pictures of the Eiffel Tower, not the pictures of us in Machu Picchu in uh, Peru. The definition of success for what we've done is when I saw my kids giving toys to the orphans. They got it. They got why we made the decision we did. So I want to raise world citizens, global change makers, world transformers, right? And the best way to do that is to show them the world and show them the needs of the world. I'm going to tell you a second story here. I was in Smoky Mountain, one of the poorest places in the Philippines. It's, in, it's on international media as well. It's on Wikipedia. I went there uh, and we saw 200 kids who are living in Smoky Mountain, which is a squatter village uh, in, um, in, um, you know, in Manila. And that broke me, okay? When you see a Smoky Mountain in person, not hearing about it in the news or the media, when you see Smoky Mountain, when you stand at the very pinnacle of Smoky Mountain, seeing the kids with no shoes on, they haven't taken showers, they're walking around, running around with broken glass everywhere, that changes you, that wrecks you, that causes you to be transformed internally and make a difference, right? So like for me, I'm an advocate for Smoky Mountain. I'm not even a Filipino, I'm not even from here, but when I see that, I'm like, let's change, alter, help Smoky Mountain. So what I'm doing at this Freedom Summit, I'm bringing in these international speakers. They're world famous. They're making multi-millions. They're coming here to the Philippines. I'm going to show them intramuros. I'm going to show them the sites. I'm going to eat the balutes, eat the traditional food. But then I'm going to take them to Smoky Mountain. I'm like, let's change, let's transform this community. Don't wait for the governments. Don't wait for the politicians. Do it from the grassroots level, right? So for me, the service is actually way more important than everything we've talked about this whole interview because that's the emotional component. It's not the financial, it's not the, uh, it's not the sightseeing, it's about how can we really help and heal this world? Because that is my definition of happiness. When I'm not living in this comfortable house that I'm comfortable, but when I'm helping people who are less fortunate uh, and I'm making a difference in their lives. Because I can complain about me not enough having money, but when you look at the eye of a child from Smoky Mountain, you have nothing to complain about, nothing, period. End of story. Question to you. Go, go. go. Next question. Otherwise, I could talk hours on end for this, Mark. <laughs> well, I, I don't want you to stop. Uh, what, you, what you just told me and to our listeners is very, really very touching and inspiring. So uh, what I realized there is number three, serving. It's not just serving the communities that you go to, but also serving yourselves and your family. I mean, you're not changing, only changing the lives of the people you you meet, but also you said your children, and, and that's also that's very important for me as a parent to to 
make uh, my kids realize um, well how lucky they, how blessed they are. So thank you. I I I, I would like to talk to you more about that. I'm sure I, I'll really learn a lot from you. But we're, since we're running, we're running out of time, um, I'd like to ask you and uh, to, to talk about talking about. Um, be, being a digital nomad uh, is, is still relatively new in the, here in the Philippines, and uh, you're you're bringing in people from everywhere, from all around the world, to come here to Manila to to teach us Filipinos how to become digital nomads. So, uh, can you talk about our that Freedom Summit uh, that's happening in the in the coming days, weeks? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I want to answer the question about the best countries for digital nomads. Uh, that would be Bali and Chiang Mai. Uh, there are a lot of digital okay. nomad families in Bali and Chiang Mai. And ironically enough, the summit is going to those two countries too, and those two cities as well. So those are the, the big uh, digital nomad hotspots. Those are the cheaper parts of the world to travel in. That's why a lot of digital nomads settle there, or not settle there, but they base themselves there. Um, so I would recommend uh, your listeners, if you're looking to maybe become a digital nomad family and base yourselves in a different country or visit a different country with a lot of international families, Bali, Chiang Mai, the top two. Okay. So now Freedom Summit Global, I'll tell you the vision and the background for that. So uh, back in Vancouver, I was actually doing conference production as well. I, I know I have a lot of job titles, so I was doing conference production <laughs> as well. Uh, so I, I, I was doing that for like five years back in Vancouver, in addition to my internet marketing stuff. I left that business uh, behind um, and then uh, I started traveling, right? But since I came here to Manila, I started doing small like meetup type of events, workshops. And then I, I, uh, I was doing meetups and workshops and I was seeing the need for more education for the freelance and entrepreneur and the growing digital nomad community locally. The digital nomad community didn't exist uh, really in terms of uh, organized structured form. And I saw that, I saw that very clearly. I was like, the digital nomad movement hadn't hit the Philippines. So I was like, okay, let's create it, right? Let's create the movement here on a local level by organizing meetups. They're called Nomad Talks. Uh, Marv is gonna be speaking at one of my Nomad Talks. Uh, um, and it was just small events, you know, 20, 30 people. Um, one time, uh, one, of my, one of my events, I had three people show up and I got sad. I got depressed. I got like, well, not depressed, but I just felt, ah, am I doing the right thing? I had three people show up, right? But don't despise the day of small beginnings, right? Like the three people, I still ran the event with the three people. I did my best. I delivered over delivered a value regardless of the number of people. Even if they were one person, I would have delivered the same value. It's not about number of people. It's about the impact of the per people who show up, right? Whether it's one, whether it's 200 plus. So I didn't give up when we did these small events. I did them in... September, October, November, uh, you know, up and down, up and down. Then uh, we had Drew Binsky come in. Uh, he's a famous travel blogger in December. That had 100 plus people when we did that event. Um, around the December mark, uh, December 2018, we decided, I decided um, that I wanted to do a conference here in Philippines uh, to bring in digital nomads, to bring in uh, international speakers. So I just started asking my friends back in Canada. I was like, in December, I was like, hey, you know, New Year, would you like to come to the Philippines to visit me? and also to see the Philippines for the first time. And also I can get you to speak at one of the conferences I'm producing. And two or three of my friends said, yes, uh, you know, I've been wanting to come to the Philippines, you're there. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about Philippines. I, I love to come, when is it? So I said, the end of March, they're like, okay, I'm in. Um, you know, they're gonna come anyway for tourism. They're gonna come anyway to go sightseeing. Then now they get an opportunity to also uh, build up their brand in Asia and speak in Asia for the first time. And, so these three people came. One of them is Darren Jacklin. He's quite a well-known figure. He's trained over 143 Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he's spoken around the world. So Darren Jacklin came. And because uh, Darren Jacklin decided to come, because of him, he's kind of the headliner. A whole bunch of other international speakers, they're like, what? You, you're doing this international conference. Uh, you know, what is it? When is it? And then I got like, now it's like 20 international speakers are flying. Crazy, right? Like almost 20 international speakers are flying in which is amazing for everyone involved, right? It's amazing for the international speakers because a lot of them have built up their brand in Canada, United States, Europe. They have not built up their Asian speaking brand. So that's what I'm helping them with, right? So it's amazing for the speakers to build up the international speaking brand in Asia. Amazing for the attendees because there's no way um, these are the attendees or delegates or guests will get a chance to meet these many international speakers in one room over two days, right? It doesn't happen. I mean, in Manila, there are a lot of events, but I don't think, there's one event with 20 plus international speakers coming in, right? So they get, the attendees, delegates get a chance to also um, uh, come. And then I think it's good for the Philippines as well because the international speakers are going to be ambassadors for this country when they leave. They'll be talking about how hospitable, how kind, how loving, how caring, 
how generous the Filipino people are. And then we raise the profile of the Filipinos globally. Uh, so it's good for the country, good for the people, good for uh, everyone, good for the globe, right? I believe travel can truly um, solve a lot of the pro problems of the world just by people from different countries visiting and meeting each other, right? People might have stereotypes, the Philippines is dangerous, or they might have heard of Duterte, right? He's kind of a controversial figure globally, <laughs> right? And yeah. No political references here, right? I don't want to go too <laughs> deep there. But you know, like kind of controversial figure, same, same with Trump, right? So by the way, people come in the Philippines, they'll see what, you know, at the end of the day, people are in the Philippines are hospitable, are kind, are loving, the food's delicious, the country's beautiful, right? So I believe it will change the world, what I'm doing, okay? I'm just being direct and blunt. And that's why I wanted to change the world. So Freedom Summit Global is happening here in Manila, 30th, 31st. If you're watching or listening to this call, before then come, or the recording's all available as well after the summit as well. So it's all at Freedom Summit Global. That's a website that's happening in the Philippines, happening in Malaysia, happening in Singapore, the three biggest English-speaking countries in Asia, Philippines, Singapore, and Malaysia, also the three biggest English-speaking cities, Manila, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and it's happening in the two biggest digital med hotspots, which are Bali and Chiang Mai. Uh, so that's what we're doing. A five CD speaking tour, uh, five summits in three weeks with 20 plus international speakers, 20 plus local speakers, including Marv, including Nix Energio, including Alan No, including John Pagalian, all our former guests of Marv on his podcast. You'll recognize yeah. his name. Friends. <laughs> and, yeah. And we have a few other things. We are also having a Freedom Summit podcast, we're having a Freedom Summit book, which will feature all the different speakers. Uh, so we're helping the goal. I told you, I'm here to serve. At the end of the day, I'm here to serve the speakers, serve the locals, serve the country that I'm visiting and living in currently, serve my wife's country, the Philippines, and serve my kids. Yes. Wow. Yes. Um, I think we're, we're, we're uh, running out of time. And thank you. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Ricky, for, for bringing that event and for inviting me as well to the Freedom Summit. So let's repeat that. That's on March 30 to 31st. Uh, to, to sign up, how do, they, uh, how do they get their tickets to the event, Ricky? Yeah, yeah very easy. So again, it's freedomsummitglobal.com. The event in Manila is happening in uh, Bonifacio Global City, BGC, at uh, Spaces World Plaza. All the info about the, uh, who's speaking, what are the topics, the venue, the times, all that's on the website, right? Directing people to the website. There's a promo video which explains what the summit's about. And people uh, can buy tickets if they're locally here in the Philippines online as well. Um, either through PayPal uh, or if they have credit cards, they can do that. Or if they want to do bank transfer, bank deposits, they can do that. So credit card, PayPal, and bank deposits. Yes, just, just, just repeat that for our podcast listeners. FreedomSummitGlobal.com So just, just type in that, uh, that link and then uh, you'll see there all the information about uh, the summit. And we'll see everyone there. So uh, before you go, Ricky, before we go, can you can give a final message to all the listeners, to, to all our freelance listeners, uh, freelance blend listeners and friends out there? Yeah, my message is this. My wife's Filipino. She found a way to travel the world. You know, she, uh, she came from, you know, not, not extreme poverty, but she was a typical middle-class Filipino. She went to University of Santa Thomas. Uh, she uh, graduated there. She got a job in IT, right? So she she uh, found a way to immigrate. I was not involved with the process at all. She immigrated on her own right to Canada. Then I met her there and then we decided to travel, right? So my wife's a very good example of, uh, you know, if a Filipino can do it, who's my wife, right? Uh, I want to give an ex example as we close of uh, Carrie Javier. She grew up in Tondo, which is one of the poorest areas in Manila. And uh, she's called the third world nomad. Uh, Marvel will probably feature her eventually as well. She's one of our speakers at a summit. So I'll give you an example of her as well. She grew up in Tondo. Her mom uh, was a house mom, you know, housewife. Uh, her dad was a taxi driver. Uh, she started her virtual assistance company called um, Prime Social. And uh, she basically generated enough income through her own means, through her own virtual assistance social media company to now travel to 20 countries. She's Filipina. She has a Filipina passport. And she's a Filipina digital nomad, third world nomad. So I want to give you examples of local people who have made it in this lifestyle. Anton Diaz, uh, you know, um, Our Awesome Planet. Uh, there's um, I am Eileen. Uh, you know, there's a lot of travel bloggers or digital nomads who have made it as Filipinos, right? And I believe this. If they can do it, so can you. So I'm talking to your speakers and listeners as, you know, like I came from Canada. I came from a middle class family. We had to make sacrifices to sell us stuff too, right? We didn't come from affluence. 
we didn't come from, we didn't win a lottery, we didn't get an inheritance, right? We still struggle, you know? I, uh, just being blunt and honest and being vulnerable with everyone here, we struggle financially too. I mean, it's just part of life. We're going to go through ups and downs. And if we share that with others, people are like, oh, you know, you're a digital nomad family who also goes through struggles financially? Yes. Do I struggle with my wife? Yeah, we fight all the time. Do I struggle to be the best dad possible? Yeah, I, I, I uh, don't invest enough time with them personally. I struggle with being a workaholic dad, right? So I'm just being a, a very honest person. And I think that's what we need more of in the freelance community. People are just being honest and just saying, this is me, this is my struggles, and this is how I've achieved whatever success I've achieved. And uh, hopefully that will help. So my, my closing thoughts are this. Um, if, if, if you have access to the internet, okay? I just want to say this. If you have access to the internet, which is a struggle in some parts of the Philippines, bad internet <laughs> joke, right? If you have access to the internet, which we all do across the Philippines, right? Even if you're in Palau, Palau and the Eastern Visayas or Southern Mindanao, you all have access to the internet. If you don't have it at home, you can go to internet cafes. If you don't have it on a laptop or Wi-Fi, you can get it on your phone, right? You can get cheap data. So if you have access to the internet, there's a world of income waiting for you uh, to do it. This, the only person that's stopping yourself from doing it is you. There's lots of resources, freelance blend, digital man. man. Oh, yeah. Oops. Yeah, a okay. little bit. Speaking of bad internet, I got, I got cut off. You okay. muted yourself, I think. I was demonstrating. That was a visual. Uh, that was a demonstration of the bad internet. It got cut off momentarily. Yeah. No, sorry. Okay. Yeah, now you can anyway, see I was talking about bad internet. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, that's just <laughs> Okay. So anyway, the I, just, I was talking about bad internet. If you have no, access to demonstrated internet, it. Uh, so anyway, you can, you can become a digital nomad. There, there seems to be an echo. Can you hear, can you me? hear me? Yes. Okay. If my bottom line is this, if okay. you can access the internet from a phone, a laptop, you can make money online, regardless of what country. you uh yeah got cut again <laughs> <laughs> okay. try again for a second Ready? 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 time okay. okay this is so funny this is so funny yeah you need to be a digital nomad it's good internet i'm just reading to you that this is what happens when you don't have good internet yeah. anyway my my bottom line is this if you can get to access to the internet through a phone, through a laptop, through an internet cafe, through a co-working space, you can become a digital nomad. Regardless of your nationality, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your gender, regardless of your passport, you can become a digital nomad. So I want to give you hope and confidence and tools and resources to do that. Uh, you can check me out at uh, daddyblogger.com, Digital Man Mastery Podcast. I'm here to help. I'm here to serve. I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the service and the impact and the making the difference. The money follows the impact I make, right? The bigger impact, the more money. So I'm here to help. I'm here to contact help. Contact me and I'd love to help you. Contact me. <laughs> That's an echo. Yeah, so that, that's my bottom line. So, yeah. So, I, we're having some technical problems, but um, on behalf of my listeners and the Filipino people, thank you very much, Ricky Shetty, for, for uh, gracing us here in our show. And we're excited for that Freedom Summit. Uh, we'll see you there. And, guys, please, uh, I'll be there. Please uh, go there. Uh, the Freelance in free, influencers in the freelance industry will be there and also in the blogging industry will be there locally and internationally. So please, please come to the Freedom Summit on March 30 to 31st. Okay, thank you guys. And thank you, Ricky. And thank you uh, to our listeners. Bye. Bye, everyone. Salamat. Salamat. It's so funny I have all these bad uh, the internet all of a sudden. Yeah.